In the past, this introduction has included a moment where I let you know that you should probably grab some stitching, something to drink, probably some food, <laughs> because this could be a long one. Hello there everybody, how's it going? It's Jessie from Jessie Murray Does Stuff here on Flosstube, and I am finally back! Woohoo! Uh, it has been a hot minute since I last did an update video, and real quick, I just want to apologize for that. Um, I'm okay, everything is fine, I've just run into all of the snafus in trying to film a video. Uh, nothing like major, nothing catastrophic. Just a bunch of little things that just prevented videos. Uh, I have tried on several different occasions, including approximately four hours yesterday, trying to film a video. And it has been totally unsuccessful. But today I'm feeling a little bit better. Um, anywhere from a stitch too far recommended that I look under the sofa to find the words that I couldn't find yesterday. Um, I looked under the sofa, all I found was dog hair, <laughs> um, but I think the words came to me in my sleep. So we are here to to try to get this done today. Um, yesterday I did try to film two separate videos. The first one was encompassing everything, the second I was trimming it down. Uh, but I've decided I'm just going to talk about everything and this is going to be a long video and I hope that that's cool with you guys. Um, but. I've got a lot to update you on because it's been almost, if not a month, since I last did a video and so there's there's a lot to talk about. Um, I am armed with my notes. I printed them out this time uh, just so that I don't have to worry about looking in the wrong spot on the screen, although I always do. And um, yeah, lots of things to talk about. So um, here's here's what you can expect during this video. I have some questions from my most recent videos that I would like to go over with you. Um, I have a topic for discussion uh, called floss tube watching um, and so we'll we'll talk about that. I have obviously my whip review. I am taking a page out of Blitz Stitches book and I am going to insert some graphs um, because you guys know that Brian and I both share this interest in in tracking and um, and graphs and things like that. So um, just like visual representations of things. And so I put together a couple for the month of June uh, that I want to share with you. Um, and as such, that will lead us into a discussion on a potential change in my rotation, if you can believe it, because I'm always doing that. Um, and then I will talk about my plans for the month of July. I have some haul retail therapy, which is 95% uh, fabric. Um, and then I have a new segment that I am introducing called Currently Obsessing. Um, so this is something that I'm reading, something that I'm watching, and something that I'm listening to that I'm just obsessed with currently. Um, so just to just talk about a couple things. And then I have some knitting. And normally I would have a conversation about books, but... Um, I haven't read anything, so none of that will be happening. So after listing all of that, this is going to be quite a video. And so let's just go ahead and get on with things. Um, and we are going to start with the questions. So the first question is coming from Debbie. And her YouTube username is, um, I'm going to list it down below here, because I do not want to mispronounce it. And I will. So. Um, but Debbie's question, um, she asked if I would be willing to show all of my current finished Cricut Collection monthlies. And so I brought those with me today to show you. So um, these are in order of the months themselves, but not in order of um, when I finished them. So um, first up, we have April. So this is the first month of the year that I have done. And this I did on a 32 count dove gray linen from Witchelt. And I love this one, super cute. Uh, love the bunny button. Are there any buttons on this one, any others? Nope, no other buttons. Um, favorite has got to be the umbrella and the eye. 
So there's that one. Next we have May. And May is done on 28 count antique white cashew linen by Zweigart. All of these fabrics are different. Um, I did not pay attention to try and keeping them all the same. I thought it would be nice to vary them a little bit. Um, and I love this one. A couple of notable changes. First of all, I had to replace two of the silks with alternates because uh, they were discontinued thread gather silk and colors. And um, I removed the last character here. There was a, a figure here that sort of appeared to be this character's mother, but I thought that it was unnecessary, and I think it looks a little bit more balanced without her. And I am going to order some more of these little bee buttons because I think that this one needs a couple more bees. They're just so cute. Chubby little bumblebees. Okay, so then next we come to the month of June. And June is technically finished, but not all the way. Um, I do not have the buttons for June. Everything is mostly as charted, except for the cake. The cake I changed the colors on a little bit to be a little bit more pink and gold to match my wedding colors since I got married on the 4th of June. And I love this. So pretty. Oh, I was checking to make sure I did the back stitch down here because I know that, that that floral bit needed some back stitch, but it's done. So yeah, just need to add the buttons, and this one will be fully done. This one is on a 32 count Belfast in Cream by Zweigart. And the last one that I have finished, how very timely. I hope that everybody in the States had a wonderful uh, 4th of July Independence Day. And I hope This fabric is 28 count Kesha linen in Confederate Grey by Zweigart. Most of this is as charted. Um, with the exception of some chronic differences. This one also is only technically finished. I don't have the buttons yet. So yeah, so those are the ones that I have finished. Um, I also have two current works in progress for the monthly series. I have, um, I have January that I started this past January, and I have August that I started last August, um, but those are just barely started. Um, I have February and October fully kitted. February, I didn't start in February because I got a little tired of the starts, believe it or not. And October, I had a nightmare with fabric last year, so I wasn't able to start it on time. But I have it ready to go October, October 1st this year. Very excited about that. That's my favorite of the whole collection, and I'm ready to, I'm ready to go. Okay, uh, so thank you, Debbie, for, for asking your question and for... Um, for helping me bring those out that sort of re-inspires me with the with the collection. Okay, next question. I have two questions from Cass. I call her Cass in my head. Uh, Cassandra, um, Cassie Stitches. She has a question about knitting, which I'm actually going to save for the knitting segment because I have two knitting questions to go over and might as well just separate the two. Um, and then she also asks a question as follows. What is a chart that you don't have but have been coveting and wanting for a while. And let me tell you, this was a hard question to answer. Seriously, anybody, sit there and think of one chart. I couldn't do it. I narrowed it down to four designers, and I picked one chart from each of them that I have had on my wish list of some kind, or, um, yeah, just one design that I've been thinking of per designer, but not one. <laughs> my gut check reaction to this was to say Tiger Lily by Mirabilia. However, I decided that that is not really something that I've been coveting and wanting for a while. I want it, it's beautiful, don't get me wrong. But do I want it because I have an affinity for Tiger Lilies, the, floor, the flowers, or because I think it's a particularly gorgeous design? Um, and a part of me answers that with no, not really. I want it because it's rare. Um, so that I thought was sort of counterintuitive, so I skipped that. So here are the four designs that I came up with. Number one, uh, from Mirabilia, one design that has sat on my wish list on one, two, three stitch for years now, um, and you know that feeling when you're on one, two, three stitch, which list, you're on one, two, three stitch, 
and you're placing a small order and you're like, you know, I should put something else in there, fill the package a bit. This design always ends up in my cart and then I remove it because I'm like, I don't need that right now. I've got nine mirrors going. I don't need this one right now. So that's that design and that is Moonflowers by Mirabelli. A preview here of what it looks like. Um, I don't know what it is about this design, but it's absolutely gorgeous. I think it was a 2015 release and I need to stitch it at some point, but I don't have it yet. Another design that ends up in my cart sometimes um, to try to help fill the box, so to speak, is Enchanted Aurora by John Elliott. Um, I don't typically gravitate towards the rainbow. Um, it's just, it's not my aesthetic. Maybe it's because I was force-fed Lisa Frank when I was a child. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so the rainbow is not necessarily my aesthetic. Don't get me wrong, I love lots of color. It's just... I typically go for more dark and twisty. Um, but that Enchanted Aurora gets me every time I see it. Um, and trying to pick a fabric for it is also proving to be a little bit complicated. Um, so that's why I haven't purchased it yet. I'm trying to think of fabric. I got something in the mail this week that I think would... I don't know if it would complement it or make it a little too crazy. Um, but I'll talk about that when, when we get to that section. Um, so that's one. From Heaven and Earth Designs, this is a design that, um, to be honest, it is new to my wish list. Um, it's probably three months old, I want to say, that it's been on my wish list. But it is, um, it is the next one that I'm buying in the next sale. And I almost bought it in this last sale, but I was trying to get, end up in the black for Stitch from Stash. Didn't happen. Um, so I didn't get it then, but next sale, whatever happens to my Stitch from Stash is what it is. Um, and it is um, Lady Seated at Her Needlework. And the artist's name, I don't know it so I will put it down here but, um, but it is from the Heaven and Earth Designs Art of the Antiquities collection and it is a beautiful um, Victorian looking painting picture of a woman who is seated and she is um, she's stitching she has a big frame in front of her and there's a guy um, standing there watching her stitch and he's kind of leaned up against the wall he gives me a Don Quixote vibe um, yeah and I just I just love it it's pretty much sepia toned but it's beautiful it's just gorgeous and I would love to have that design probably more than stitching retreat I would love to have that design on my wall because it's just gorgeous um, so that one I'm probably going to get in the next Heaven and Earth Design Sale. The next one, I don't know the name of the designer, um, but it is Kingdom of Books. Do you guys remember when everybody went nuts over Kingdom of Books? Well, so did I, because of course. I mean, stitching and books, and it almost has a Russian architecture kind of feel to it. Obsessed. I love that design. But... I have this thing that when a design gets uber popular, I tend to back off a little bit because I don't know why it is, but like for instance, Coffee Quaker. When we first started seeing what was going to be released at Nashville, the only thing that I truly bookmarked, no, there were two. Uh, the Glendon Place, um, I Love You, I Love You? can't remember exactly what it's called. Um, that one was one that I bookmarked, and the other was Coffee Quaker by Heartstring Samplery. And then everybody lost their flippin' mind over this design, and everybody started it, and a bunch of people finished it, and there were color changes, and everybody's, everybody's interpretations of it, absolutely stunning. But it hurt that design for me. So that's kind of my feelings towards Kingdom of Books. Um, for a while there, it was in high demand by everybody, 
And I just wasn't, I was like, all right, I'm going to back off a little bit and give it some time. And so Kingdom of Books is starting to appeal to me a little bit more now that things have quieted a bit. Um, am I a follower of fads? Sometimes, but I don't know. Sometimes the hype is too intense for me. So, so there's that. So those are my four. Amira, a Joan, a Heaven and Earth, and a other recognizable design. Um, everything in me wanted to include a Chatelaine. However, the Chatelaine that I'm really after isn't done yet. Um, it is Hortus Venenum. Um, which is based on the um, Poison Gardens. Um, that one is another one that is suffering from this super high popularity thing, but I don't know that I care um, for that because I, yeah, I need that in my life. There's that. Okay, that was a long spiel about charts that I want. Um, okay, uh, Carolina. Uh, from Crafts Makeup Food, her channel, as well as Cassie's, will be linked down below. Um, how do you, Carolina asks, how do you decide when to keep using a length or to park it and start a new one when it's the same color? And this is going to be one of those answers that is totally unsatisfying, but when it's too short, that's pretty much how I decide. Too short for me is okay so when I'm stitching and I'm gonna take a picture or insert a picture here when I'm stitching on my heaven and earth designs which is primarily where I, when I park I will bring the thread to the block that I'm um, that I'm gonna park in and then those parked threads are up and out of my way they are off to the right um, to the upper right and they are wrapped around a needle minder or behind a needle minder. They are kept. Um, if I am parking a thread that doesn't reach that, and I notice in that block that I'm parking in that I need that color a lot, I would much rather tie that thread off and start a new one in that block when I get there. Um, if it can't reach that cluster of threads sitting out of my way. Um, when I am stitching my Heaven and Earth design, uh, when I'm parking, I want everything out of my way. I need to be able to see where my space that I'm working in. Um, so you guys know I work in the diagonals. If there's a block over here that I haven't stitched yet, those threads are pulled off on this side. Um, those threads that I am parking in the block below, those are pulled straight down. Those threads that are parked in the diagonal that I've already stitched, those are pulled off to the right. Um, and it's, it's just so that I can clear some space so that I can see, um, see where I'm working. So, yeah, that's pretty much how I decide. Uh, I, it's too short. Um, and then she also asked a question about beading on my frames, on my Millennium frames. Um, do I roll up the beads? Yes, um, but with, um, with caveat. So I bead absolutely last, absolutely dead last. Um, and there is an order in which I do things. So I start small and work my way up to the larger beads. So I will do the seed beads and the delicas and the magnificas and those first. Then I'll do the vertical laying bugle beads because when I roll those up, they are at high risk for cracking because I still ratchet up the tension on my Millennium, um, but you can imagine that that long tube of a bead being pulled around a, something circular, it's going to break. Um, and then I will also save the larger crystals till the end. Um, so I'm thinking my Frosty Knot Garden Chatelaine. Um, I did the cube crystals absolutely last because those things are huge. They were like six millimeters. They were big. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's the order in which I do things. Now, I also protect the beads. So I will roll things up with a piece of quilt batting lodged 
laying over top of the beads and then rolled in. Um, and it is um, like a half inch thick, I want to say, maybe an inch thick. Um, so it's just an extra padding. It's just a little bit extra pillow, it's essentially, for the beads that are rolled up. Um, I try to bead as fast as I can because I'm just, I just don't want them to break or bend or get shifted or the invisible, the Nymo thread to stretch because that will mess up the, the final appearance of it. So um, I bead as fast as I can. Um, in other words, I devote a chunk of time to, the, to it. Uh, if I reach the point where I need to do my vertical laying bugle beads and it's like 10.30 at night and I know that I'm not gonna finish that night, then I wait till the next day because I just don't wanna mess with that. So, so yeah, I do roll them up uh, with quilt batting that I cut to size. Um, and I think I have a picture because I've talked about this before, so I'll insert that so that you can see it. Okay, the next and final question comes from Solar Stitches, and she asks, when you kit up a project from your master set of floss um, into Flossway bags, how many lengths do you start with? And I brought an example to show you, but just one. Uh, so this is a kit from... I don't remember which design this is, isn't that funny? Um, anyway, so yeah, I just put in one length and a length for me is four foot if I'm stitching two over two or two over um, because the loop method, so it's approximately two foot in usable length. Um, if I'm stitching one over one, then it is a two foot length because it's still just a, a working two foot length. Um, and the reason that I do that is that I don't know necessarily how much of a color is going to be used, and this is particularly true for um, my Cricut Collection monthlies and my monthlies also from Cottage Garden Samplings, uh, those the floral ones that I am like pseudo doing. Um, some of those colors are not called for in very large quantities, and so I don't want to pull like two, three, four lengths when it's not really necessary. Um, so I just start with one, and then when that length runs out, I refill it, and then that's pretty much it. Um, so that's that. And that is it for the questions. So thank you everybody so much for asking your questions. As always, if you have them, leave them in the comments below and I'll get to them next time. Okay, so let's move on to floss tube watching. And I am going to do two things. I'm gonna talk about some of my new floss tube watching habits, and then I'm going to do a shout out. So, um, my new habits are as follows. For the last six to eight months or so, I have subscribed to absolutely nobody new. Nobody. Um, I was having a hard time keeping up with my current subscriptions, my watch later list. I would clear out and then add new videos and then clear out. Most recently, I reached over 250 250 videos in my watch later list and I was never going to catch up with that um, so I wasn't subscribing to anybody new and I feel really bad about that like I don't I don't like that because I know that when I was new those new subscriptions were really important to me it really fueled the fire to keep me doing videos um, and so I felt like I was doing a disservice by not watching the newest floss tubers. It's a real ego boost when you see that number tick up. Um, we all say that we're not about the numbers, and truly, we're not about the numbers, but still, seeing that number grow, it's, it's valuable. It's a valuable thing. So, anyway, so I wasn't subscribing, but I am now, because I cleared out that watch later list. I removed absolutely everything that was there. Um, and I started adding in again, starting in June. Because of my new work schedule, I'm actually watching floss tube while I'm working, if I'm working on something that doesn't require my undivided attention. So I am I'm able to watch floss tube throughout the day, which is phenomenal. I am now watching more videos during the day than are released during the day, which is truly the only way that I'm gonna be able to keep up. Um, and I'm subscribing to everybody new. So I may not be necessarily watching your channel from the beginning, from the very start, 
but I'm keeping up with you now. Um, let's see, what else? What else is uh, one of my new habits? I'm commenting on every single video that I watch, every one. Um, and this is something that I started probably three weeks ago, but was sort of driven home last week with the passing of Beverly Avenger. Uh, Bev and Teddy Bear, uh, most everybody on PlusTube recognizes that username. This was a woman who, without fail, commented on every single PlusTube video. And her passing is palpable. Um, it is strange to not see her name pop up anymore. And it is strange to not see, for whatever reason, and I don't know if anybody else had this, I had to review every one of her comments. Every time she left a comment, I had to review it and approve it. For whatever reason. Um, but it's strange to not get that notification that I have a comment to review. Um, and so she was consistent and she left such nice words. She was just a genuinely sweet person. She was a blessing for our community because our community has gone through some growing pains for the last few years. But she was like a statue in the storm, like just, just so nice and kind. And goodness, do we need a lot of that. And I know that I'm not the only one who feels this way, but the only way that I have been able in the past to keep up with watching videos is to just put them in my watch later list and just let them go. And sometimes I'll comment and sometimes I'll like, but not consistently, not constantly. And that's important. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but those comments mean a lot. They are, they're, they're valuable to me. Your conversation with me is the whole reason that I do this. I don't want to talk to a camera and not talk to anybody else. I may be introverted, but I am not reclusive. And so when we get to have a conversation about stitching, that's, that's just great. Um, I haven't been the best at replying to comments or um, staying engaged in conversation. And so I'm trying to get better at that. I'm working on that. Um, and Beverly is a part of the reason. Part of the reason was just a sense of responsibility. Um, so I am commenting now. Um, but I am giving myself opportunity to do that because I'm working from home and I'm, um, I've got it playing in front of me. And so I just pause the watch later, the, the autoplay, write a comment, say something. And usually, because I'm wordy, I write a novel, but that's okay. Um, because I just want you guys to know that I'm watching. Um, I don't know. I just think that that's important. And I know that not everybody has that opportunity. I know that there are some that hold on to all 500 videos in their watch later list and are trying to get through them. And kudos to you. Um, I can't do that. I just, I can't do that. Um, because there are some conversations in those older videos, like, about pre-election stuff. Like... The world has changed so much since then, and it hasn't been a year yet. So anyway, um, so those are kind of my new habits. I just kind of wanted to share that. Um, and as such, I have decided to bring back my own shout outs. Now there are plenty of floss tubers that will do shout outs. Um, I've done them in the past, either uh, when I was doing the shout outs a few years ago to infuse some positivity, or when I started doing the tag, you're awesome. Um, there are lots that do um, specifically new floss tubers. There are, um, yeah, I'm trying to think if there are any others. Um, I know that several will make mention specifically of the male stitchers, which is phenomenal. Um, so I am going to shout out a new to me. Um, and this is not necessarily somebody that is new. Um, it is not necessarily somebody that is, um, that has just one video out. 
It's just somebody that's new to me because I have started subscribing to absolutely everybody. And so yeah. So today I am shouting out Felicity from Felicity Fish Cross Stitcher. I have to make sure and take my time to say that one, Felicity, um, because I will trip over it. Um, but Felicity is, um, she actually is new. Um, she just put out her first video within the last couple of weeks. Um, and I think her plan was to do monthly videos. Um, Felicity, I have followed on Instagram for a long time um, because of one particular design. And that is her heaven and earth design, Elsa. Elsa is artwork by Anna Dittman, which you guys know I love for my April. Um, and it is based on Disney's Elsa from Frozen. Um, and it is absolutely gorgeous. It is a retired chart for pretty obvious reasons, Disney and all of that. Um, but it's beautiful. It's absolutely gorgeous. Um, Anna Dittman rendered her eyes and then Heaven and Earth's design charted it in a way that I just, my jaw dropped when Felicity showed it on her video. I mean, you know, I've seen pictures on Instagram for quite a while now, but seeing it on camera, like all of it, in all of its glory, was just something to behold. I mean, really, I just, I love it. Love it so much. Um, and Felicity is working on several other gorgeous things. Another Heaven and Earth design, Beloved, I believe, which is the black and white. Um, and um, several other things. But Elsa just stood out to me. And um, in Felicity's first video, she talks about some of her, um, some of her oldest projects. And she talks about all of the whips that she currently has going. And um, yeah, just really a lot of fun to watch. So her channel will of course be linked down below. Please go check her out, give her some love. Um, she mentions that she's starting to struggle a bit with the bottom of Elsa because she's pretty much out of the woods, so to speak, in the, in the fact that um, she's in largely just background and beige and cream and white and that sort of a thing. Um, as Anna Dittman does, her artwork is a figure, a face, and then gorgeous tendrils, but by and large, nothing of real interest in the background. Um, and Felicity said that she's starting to struggle a bit with that because that's all she's got left. Um, so give her some love, um, cheer her on so that she can get that thing done. Um, oh, it's so beautiful. Really, you're doing yourself a good service by, by seeing it. Um, so thank you, Felicity, for starting doing videos. Um, can't wait to see more from you. Okay, now that we're like 30 minutes in, oh gosh, I hope you guys stopped and went to go get food. I hope that you realize that this is going to take a while. Um, or that you're watching this over several days. Okay, so let's get started with the whip review. Uh, the last time that I saw you guys, about a month ago, I had talked to you about my fantasy sale. And by Lakeside Needlecraft and Doreen Jones. And for that sale, I was planning on working on it again for the rest of that day, as well as the next day, which would have been Thursday. And what ended up happening is that I didn't stitch any more on it. Um, I didn't work on it that Wednesday evening, and I didn't stitch at all the following Thursday. Um, so no further progress was made on the fantasy cell. I will show you that here in a little bit because it is going to come up in my plans for July. But by and large, um, that's really all. That I'm not going to bring it out right now. So that following Friday was the start of my next Heaven and Earth Design weekend. And so as you guys know, my current rotation says that I work on Heaven and Earth Designs on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And you'll be seeing a preview here of what this looked like the last time you saw it. This design is, of course, the Faces of Fairy 201. The artwork here is by Jasmine Beckett Griffith. And at that time, I had about 1,200 stitches to go on page two. And that Friday, I finished page two. So I'm going to insert pictures um, as we go along here to show you the progress on each of the weekends. So that Friday, I finished the page. <laughs> 
Um, I haven't done 1,200 stitches in a day, and I can't even tell you how long. Probably not since my marathon. Um, so, uh, my stitch-a-thon, not a marathon. Let's face it, I'm not running a marathon. Anyway, <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, I, I just got in a good groove, and I finished out the page, and it was, it was really, really cool to do. So then, for, uh, on Saturday, I started working on page four, and I got uh, about 600 stitches in, and I was like, you know what, I'm done. Yeah, I'm, I'm just done. Um, I really just wasn't feeling like working on it anymore. Um, the thing about this design is the background. I really detest the background, that green background. For whatever reason, the way that it's charted, I just don't find fun. And that's crazy to me because I love the background for April, which is 90% background, but I just, for whatever reason, I didn't like this. And I think that I had worked too hard on Friday, so I got burned out pretty quick. So I didn't stitch a whole lot on Saturday. And then on Sunday, I put in about 100 stitches, and I was like, you know what? This is not going well. Um, I'm not enjoying myself. This is supposed to be my Sunday. My Sundays are supposed to be my big stitchy days. And I'm not having fun. So let me go ahead and put this down. I did some good work. I managed about 2,000 stitches in the weekend. That's good enough for me. So let's put it down. So I did. Um, and so you'll be seeing a preview here of what this looked like um, after that weekend and everything that I had finished at the, up to that point. Okay, so we're up to this Sunday. And this Sunday was not a good stitching day for me. I'm just going to preface by saying that I struggled on this particular day. So, put faces down. I'm like, alright, what's next? I had three designs left for the month of June to work on. I had the Heron by Leslie Tear, which I was using for the Wine and Whips in Stitch Mania. I had the Flowering Flourish by Connie G Designs uh, for the Tour de Designer, Connie G Designs. And I also had my Birthstone Dragon Sal by Ingleside Imaginarium. I chose not to pull out the Birthstone Dragon Sal because I had just spent the last week on a sal, and so I kind of wanted some different style of stitching. I didn't want more blocks, so to speak. So. I was like, I'm just going to hold off on that. I'll wait until next week to do that. Um, so I was like, let me start off with my heron. You know, it's got some bright colors, and let's just go with that. So this is the heron by Leslie Tear, preview here of what it would look like finished. And I'm not going to insert a preview of what it looked like last time because this is now a UFO, um, and I will not be finishing it. This is on uh, 28 count, not so even, even weave from MCG Textiles. I believe it's white. Um, and I, I am done with this project. Um, the primary reason is just the fabric. Um, and as a result, I don't like my stitches. I don't like the process. I don't like the product. This is not worth my time anymore. Um, and could I put it in the temporary pile and maybe I'll come back to it later? Probably, but I'm going to have these same sentiments no matter what. I'm done. Like, I'm just done. Um, I'm going to bring it in close so that you can see the gaps in the stitching. The stitches are taller than they are wide. I don't like this anymore. And I wouldn't want to hang it in my bathroom, let alone but put in the effort to finish it. Uh, I had a thought to finish just this page and cut it off there, but that's silly, and again, I don't like it, and I don't like the way it looks. For a long time, my uh, stitching was unlimited. I had absolutely no limit to the amount of time I could spend on a, in a day stitching. But now that things are a little bit different, now that I'm not stitching eight hours a day, I have to be a little bit more particular about what I'm stitching. And I want to love what I'm stitching. And this, I don't love it. I don't even like it. Um, so this was really kind of easy for me to just be like, nope, I'm done. So that is that. Um, if 
anybody wants it, I will be happy to send it to you. Um, it is almost half done. You will be responsible for the chart as well as your own threads because I have already unkitted it. Um, but I can send you a half done project if you want it. I mean, no problem. We can talk if you're interested. Um, yeah, I, but I'm done. <laughs> so there's that. Okay, so we are 0 for 2, striking out so far. So I was like, all right, well, that leaves me with the Flowering Flourish by Connie G Designs. And preview here of what this looks like as stitched. Um, this design I'm doing with beads. Um, and I am stitching it on Darkness Falls by Under the Sea Fabrics. Uh, this is a 32 count Belfast and it is opalescent. Uh, so it sparkles. Guess what y'all? I'm done with this one too. But this one I'm going to restart. So this one is not up for grabs. Um, so here's the thing. With the hand dyeing process, 32 count Belfast usually shrinks down to about 33 to 36 count depending. So this weave is already tighter. Add on to that that it's an opalescent. So there are fibers of uh, sparkly thread woven in. So that makes it even tighter. I was using Mill Hill Beads um, item number 2010. So they are not petites, they are just regular old Mill Hill seed beads. And guess what, y'all? They do not sit pretty. I mean, I've talked about this a lot since finishing my Frosty Knot Garden, that I just love the way the delicas sit. And these do not. They don't do that. On top of the fact that Mill Hill beads are seed beads, and so they are very round, um, they're inconsistent, and as such, they're a little bit too big for this. I think I measured it to be closer to 34 and a half count um, at this point, um, and that's a rough estimate. Um, they don't fit, and so they don't sit right, and um, I'm going to draw your attention to this part right here, the top of this curl. Do you see that? You see how janky they look? No. I don't, again, I don't like the process and I don't like the product. So why am I doing this? Why am I putting myself through misery for this? I tell you, I'm not. I'm going to rip them all out. And it'll be really easy to rip out because just cut off that Nymo thread in the back and they will all come off. Not a problem, no stress to me. Um, and I am going to order some Delicas. I gotta tell you, I might have them because you know I had to order those ones for Frosty. So I might have some crystal colored Delicas and then I'm also gonna get some white pearly Delicas to do on this side. Um, because they will sit ever so nicely and they'll be gorgeous and I won't hate it. I don't hate it. I shouldn't say that. That's a little dramatic. But I won't dislike it. And I can I can rest easy putting this down, at least for now. So that one is not available, but nonetheless, UFO. Done. And I'll restart that at some point. I have no idea when. It is not high on my priorities. So 0 for 3 on this Sunday. Like I said, Sundays are supposed to be my days. Where, you know, like I make up for the week. Like, whatever I didn't get done Monday through Friday, I do on Sunday. <laughs> Strikeout. So I gave up. I was like, for whatever reason, this is not happening today. The universe doesn't want me to stitch. I guess I'm done. And Danny was like, okay. He could tell. <laughs> And I might have made it apparent that I was frustrated by this. Um, but he was like, all right, walk away. Walk away. Go knit. Go read. Go putz on your phone. Go, go do something. But pick something to work on tomorrow. And have it set up and ready to go first thing tomorrow morning. Um, start fresh tomorrow. Today's not the day. It's going to be fine. Start fresh tomorrow. And I was like, but... 
I don't want to work on my birthstone dragons. I don't want to do that right now. And he was like, well, don't. I'm like, well, then what do I work on? He said, this is obviously an issue of what you really want to work on. So why don't you work on something you really want to work on? <laughs> I'm like, well, who made you the smartest man alive? Anyway, so I did that. So I had a look at my year of whips because my focus is still on these this pile of year of whips. And I was like, all right, something that I love, something that I haven't worked on in a while, something that needs some attention. So I pulled out Long Dog Samplers Opus 2. And I put it on my frame and I set it up. And I didn't stitch on it on Sunday, but I did on Monday and for the rest of the week. This is also known as Maggie um, for reasons that I've talked about ad nauseum. Uh, needle minder here is an agate slice from Nifty Needle Nannies. And preview here of what this looked like when I started stitching on it that week. Uh, this is on a 28 count antique white cashew linen from Zweigart. I'm stitching it using DMC 924. And my focus for this particular week was to get to the top. To get to the top right corner so that from here on out, I just have to work down. And so I did. So you can, you can totally see the trail that I took. Started here, used all of these as anchors to work over here, to work up, to get to the top. And the progress... It wasn't a ton. It wasn't a lot of stitching done in that week, but it was stitching and I enjoyed every single stitch, which was arguably the most important part. Um, but I got to tell you something. And while I was stitching this, particularly this top border here, I had a thought. How in the heck do you guys stitch these monochromatic designs with hand dyed threads? I wouldn't even know where to start. I wouldn't know which route to take to do that with this. All of the motifs in this border that I call Quaker jellyfish rowboats, um, and I'll explain that here in a second, um, they're all connected. All those motifs are connected. I wouldn't know where to start <laughs> if I was using a hand dye thread or a variegated thread. I just, I can't even fathom it. It was a struggle, and I was using DMC, where I could just do one leg and then do the other leg back. Anyway, you guys are my hero. Those of you doing death by cross stitch in hand dyed threads like Emily, um, or Ingeborg doing the Mother Maya, couldn't do it. Could not do it. Anyway. The reason that this top border is called, to me, Quaker Jellyfish Rowboats is this floral motif is like a Quaker flower that is prevalent throughout this. I mean, there's a big one right there. Um, and it's a motif that I've seen a lot of Quaker designs. Um, this kind of looks like a jellyfish to me. Oh, upside down. It also looks like a strawberry, but I decided to go with jellyfish. And then these little what almost look like palm fronds, almost look like um, oars on a boat to me. So this is the Quaker Jellyfish rowboat border. <laughs> and I'm just going to go with that. And it is repeated across the top. Um, and I just, I was, I just had a good time stitching on this. I think I treated this fabric with fray check because the edges feel sharp. Um, anyway, uh, this project is going to come back out in September um, for the Stitch Mania Back to School Sal. It's the month long Sal, and I'm just going to work on the alphabet and try to get the alphabet done that month. Um, of everything that I worked on, none of the motifs are done. <laughs> so we have the um, signature, I guess, here. Um, and I didn't finish the rest of the date because I don't think I'm going to finish it this year. But who knows? I don't know when I'm going to finish it. This motif here, totally not even close. The alphabet, you can, you can see how I traveled over. Um, the A isn't finished, which I just discovered yesterday when I was looking at this. 
Um, and then this border, like I said, is repeated across the top. So, so much work left to do, but had a blast doing it. One thing that I want to mention is that my taste, and everybody does this, but my taste has changed so much and it does so frequently. There are a lot of people truly interested in the, the primitive style designs, um, either reproduction samplers or samplers. Um, there's a lot of interest in more modern style cross stitch, um, like the Jones and the Miras, etc. There are people who have their interest in the heaven and earth designs. For me, right now, Quaker designs, for whatever reason, are ticking every single box for me. Every time I see a new Quaker design, I'm like, I need that. I need that. I want that. Um, Long Dog Samplers and the Stickadine von der Weinberg, I believe. Forgive me, those who speak the German language. I, am apolog I, I apologize profusely for if I ruined that. Um, who else? Rosewood Manor Quaker style designs. I am loving me some Quaker stuff. And I'm not buying any because I could see myself falling down that rabbit hole and putting myself into financial failure in the process. But yeah, just ticking all the boxes for me. So it was really great to work on this design that um, helps bring me out of this funk that I found myself in, this purge that I was doing, and um, yeah, spend some time on, on something fun. So there's that. The lighting, you might have noticed, just changed significantly. The sun went behind a cloud, but I've got my my lighting going on, so everything still looks so good. Oh, I love the way this green pops off the antique white. It's just, it makes me so happy. Anyway, so there's that. So then, we reached another Heaven and Earth Designs weekend. And so, this weekend was a whole lot more successful. I finally got out of the background on that page four, and I was able to get into some confetti, which I really needed. I needed some confetti. So, um, I was able to work on that the whole weekend, Friday through Sunday. And I'm going to insert a preview here of what this looked like at the time when I finished that weekend. Um, again, just a picture, just to show you the progression over the last month or so. And um, yeah, really pleased with the progress that I made that weekend. Back on track. Um, that Opus 2 was really sort of like a, like a Kickstarter for me. So next we get to the following Monday. And the following Monday, I was finally time to pull out my Birthstone Dragons um, by Ingleside Imaginarium and Brittany. And you'll be seeing a preview here of what this looked like the last time you saw it. Um, Basically, I didn't have May or June complete. And I still do not have May or June complete. Um, there was uh, not a lot of stitching progress. This was the week where I had all of the things. Uh, I had a terrible migraine. I had a doctor's appointment. I had double swollen eyelids, like just all of the reasons. But I made some progress, and I made some pretty decent progress. I set myself up pretty well for, for July. Um, so, yeah, so I got going on May, and May is all of the cross stitches are complete. It's just the back stitch that I have left to do, and then I also have to attach uh, the, the crystal. June, I barely got started on the, I believe it was Thursday, yes, it was Thursday, uh, and I ended up having a frog. So the universe was like, nope, you're not stitching. Um, I frogged what I had to, I restitched a little bit just to feel a little bit better about myself, and then I put it down. Uh, I didn't work too, too hard on trying to get caught up. Um, but the Emerald Dragon, which I really love, love how he turned out, um, is turning out I should say, 
uh, you may be able to see just a hint of a sparkle in the crystal there. So you guys know I am replacing all of the gems with, with these guys that I've uh, acquired. And they are all appropriately themed, etc. But this one, with the large size of it and the placement of it, I couldn't do that. I couldn't... I couldn't just replace it with this little little crystal. So he is still going to be, he's still going to have the other crystal. And I already know where I'm going to put it, but I'll talk about that when it's done. Um, and I stitched the crystal, but I added a little bit of sparkle to it. Um, and I used this, which is uh, Glisten Gloss Rainbow Blending Filament, item number 000. Um, I just put one strand with the two strands as charted for the gem, just to give it a little bit of shine. Um, and so, just to give it a little bit of extra something there. So there's that. And we will continue on and on. I didn't do any of the border this go around, but that's okay. I'll get there. So there's that. Um, and the fabric here, gosh, I hope I've been, I think I have. Uh, this fabric is 32 Count Belfast in Sparkling Diamonds by Crafty Kitten Fabrics. Um, and the pinks aren't coming through. It's blues and pinks. And a little bit of a hint of purple, but it's all very subtle. That was that for, uh, for birthstone dragons. So that took me up to the next weekend. And the next weekend was the last weekend encompassing June, uh, Friday the 30th, and then the 1st and 2nd of July. And so I pulled out my Faces of Fairy 201 again for the weekend. And I didn't get a whole lot of progress done this, this last weekend. Um, and the reason for that is that I ran completely out of a color. And I still haven't organized my own DMC stash, if you can believe it, guys. Um, there's a lot of stuff that um, is kind of everywhere, and so I still have to organize it. So, again, I'm paying attention to what the universe is telling me. <laughs> if I ran out of this color, then that means the universe wants me to move on, and so I did. Um, so you'll be seeing a preview here of what this looked like after that point. I stopped stitching on it at some point during Saturday. Um, I didn't make more than a few hundred stitches progress. I think I did 500 total for the weekend. And I moved on. So, conveniently enough, that Saturday was July the 1st. Um, and I will get to that here in just a second. But before I do, I kind of want to wrap up June for you with the graphs that I put together. So, I have just two. And the first one here has a lot of information on it, a lot. Um, there are essentially four different things being tracked. So this is encompassing the entire year. Uh, the top bar, or excuse me, the top uh, line graph that you see there is a trend line watching my number of whips. And so you can see that I started the year with a total of 69 whips. And at the end of June, I was up to 81. Um, no, at the end of June, I was down to 79. Um, so because of the starts during May, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, below that, you will see another trend line, and that is tracking specifically year of whips. Um, and so you will see that at the start of June, I had 16 Year of Whips projects, and here at the start of July, I had 13 Year of Whips. Okay, the bar graph is how the other ones are calculated. So the first bar that you see there on the left um, is the number of starts. And so, for instance, I'll draw your attention to the big one, and that is the month of May. I had 17 new starts in the month of May. I also had two finishes in May, and I had two projects that I put in the UFO bin in May. Um, and so that's why you see that, um, that the number of whips went from 68 to 81 
because I had 17 new starts, but subtract from that four projects that I either finished or UFO'd. Um, so that gets you to the 81. That gets you a 13 project increase. Um, so you can see it between June and July, there are there was a decrease of three year of WIPS projects, but there was only a decrease of two. Yes, that's that's right. Sorry guys, I got I got a little bit confused there. Okay, so in June I started Avarice, so that was an increase of one. Then I finished June by the Cricut collection, so we're at a zero. Then I put two projects in the UFO bin that I just talked to you about, both the Heron and Flowering Flourish. So my year of whips went down by three. My total number of whips went down by just two. So yeah, I just kind of wanted to see how that is trending. Um, so I'm down to just 13 year of whips, which means I'm down to just 15 total whips, which is crazy that I'm working on for the rest of the year, I should say. Okay. Let's take a look at June specifically. I'm going to put up that graph here. And again, there are two things being tracked here. You can see the bar graph at the bottom, and that is tracking stitches. The dots indicate the number of days that I devoted to each project. So you can see that I had two days where I didn't stitch at all in the month of June. Uh, literally June by the Cricut Collection, I stitched for two days, and I did 1,560 stitches. Uh, the Fantasy Sal, I spent eight days on it for a total of 4,000 stitches. Here's the most notable thing about this whole thing. Eleven days were spent on Faces of Fairy 201 for a total of over 7,000 stitches. And that struck me. Um, I mean, it was to be expected. I work on it every weekend. But it's very skewed here. Now, I know that Brian does these as well. Um, Brian from Blistitch, and he tracks um, blocks of a hundred, but not necessarily every stitch. This is every stitch, uh, these numbers here. Uh, and the reason that I do that is that I participate in the Ultimate Cross Stitch Group, and they do constant challenges, and so I'm constantly counting stitches anyway. So this is a, an accumulation of all of those stitches. Um, and so this is as accurate as I can um, on this. So there you have it. So this graph here is what's making me question my rotation. Now, yes, it's phenomenal to get a ton of progress on a heaven and earth design. It's great that I can confidently say that this project is going to be done this year because I accomplish about 800 stitches a day. Give or take, usually it's closer to seven, maybe even 600 um, nowadays. And that's my average. Um, so it's hard for me to commit so much time to this project. So much time is committed to it. And everything else is progressively getting less and less time. So for instance, most notably, my birthstone dragon sal, I worked on it for three days and I got 700 stitches done on it. I'm never going to finish that sal at that rate. Um, my, let's see, my opus 2 has so much work left to do on it. I was able to commit five days to it. That's not right. It was only four. Um, because I put it on my frame on the first day, but I didn't stitch on it that first day. Anyway, five days, 1,100 stitches. And like, my weekends are my big stitching weekends. So I am essentially totally excluding my big stitching weekends from my year of webs, from these projects that I really wanted to finish this year. So that's kind of a bummer. Um, I'm, not, I'm not loving that. So I'm contemplating going back to my weekly rotation where I spend seven days on a project or a theme. So I am contemplating starting in the month of August going to um, 
week one, Heaven and Earth, week two, one of my Year of Whips, week three, my Sows, week four, another one of my Year of Whips, or back to the other one. Um, I'm thinking about it. I have loved watching this Heaven and Earth design progress as quickly as it has. Uh, based on my projections, I could have it done by mid-October. And that is with football season and with travels and with the floss tube retreat. I could have it done by mid-October. And at the start of this year, I didn't have a page done. <laughs> so a part of me is, is kind of drawn to sticking with what I've currently got going. And a part of me is like, yeah, but look at Opus 2 and look at Rose Fairy and look at Shades of Wine. Oh my gosh, that one's never going to get done this year. <laughs> Even if I do switch up my rotation, that one's never going to get done this year. And, but that was my big goal for the year was to get those done. So I don't know. Um, I'm sticking with this Weekend Hades through the rest of July because we're already into it and um, I've just got some different ideas about July um, but it's still on my radar to think about changing so anyway so there's that um, working on a few things and making a lot of progress sounds really good to me um, but I'm not doing that, as it turns out, because I am excluding my big stitching weekends from those projects that need the most attention. So, anyway, some food for thought for me, essentially. Okay, all of that rotation talk aside, let's talk about my plans for July. Now, July is Joan Elliott July, um, and this is sort of an event that started as a very small conversation between two friends, between Belinda, Ozzy Sitcher, and I, um, and has grown to about 100 people. <laughs> um, and so basically, we're just taking the month and focusing on Joan Elliott designs. You don't have to make new starts. Um, you don't have to work on whips. You can do whatever you want. You don't have to work on it all month long. Um, it's totally low-key and um, no pressure whatsoever. Um, and it's kind of started because I mentioned how I wanted to start Ladybird Fairy after Belinda finished hers, and she wanted to start the reader after I enabled her to, to start it. <laughs> um, so anyway, it's, it seems like a lot of people have shown some great interest in this, and that's really exciting. So I started a Facebook group. Um, originally we were just going to keep it low-key and keep it in a group chat, but it quickly became uh, we need to be in a, in a true group. Um, and so we have several admins, including myself and Belinda. There is also Terry from Stitching Petunia. And we have um, Stephanie from Miss Oso oh Crafty. And um, Joan Elliott is in the group, which is like <sighs> fangirl. Um, <laughs> But, um, so it's pretty great. So I will have that linked below so you guys can come join if you'd like. Um, it is a closed group. We just approve you just in case, uh, just to make sure that whoever is trying to join will, uh, is actually a stitcher. Um, and one thing I did want to mention is that this is going to last through July. So come and post and everything. Um, and then we're going to archive the group and open it back up for a second annual next year. So this is going to be an annual thing. It's just Joan Elliott July. Um, and I know that a lot of things are happening in July. I know that a lot of people like to focus on Christmas designs in July. And there's lots of holidays. The Northern Hemisphere has their summer. And so it's not necessarily going to be like high on everybody's priority list. But it could help you decide what you want to work on in July. So... Anyway, so I just thought that I would put that little PSA out there, um, and I'm going to show you what I'm going to be working on for July, for the most part, and I'll talk about that here in a second. Um, and the first project that I pulled out is my Rose Fairy, and um, I pulled this out actually on Saturday the 1st, because I ran out of a color for faces, and so I just put it down as I talked about listening to the universe. 
So I pulled out Rose Fairy a day early and I put in five days on this girl and five pretty good days. Um, I made some really good progress. Am I going to get this finished this year? No, absolutely not. But um, I, I finally was able to put some good time into this. So uh, this is where I'm starting and I'm referring to her as my old lady because she's been a whip since 2014. And actually, her whip birthday was on Wednesday. Yes, Wednesday. Wednesday the 5th. Um, so she turned three on Wednesday. I've got a toddler. <laughs> and uh, this um, fairy door here is from Brenda's Minders and More, I believe. Yes, that came from Brenda. Um, so that is my rose fairy. Preview here of what this looked like before I got started stitching. I can't remember the last time I showed this in a video. Um, so I don't necessarily have a clip. I'm stitching this on 28 count Lugana in confetti by Picture This Plus. And here's where we are. I can't see any of her skin. That's great. Okay, well, it'll look better when I get all of the skin in. But I made some really great progress, you guys. First things first, the skirt is done. There's no more skirt left to do. Um, she does have a chronic belt here, but everything is done in the skirt. Um, and obviously there's some flowers, and her hand is up here holding this petal from her skirt. And then I'm going to bring this in close so that hopefully you can see. Can you see that? I did start working on the skin. Now this fabric is majority yellow. So, um, of course, the... Caucasian skin tones are going to blend in a little bit. Um, so I've got like the out the outline of her skin done. And I have the two darkest shades done on this leg and the very darkest shade done on this leg that's kind of kicked out back here. Um, and I'm going to say something here that's going to shock most of you who have been with me for a while. I've never done skin one over one on even weave. Never. I've always done it on linen. And guess what? I might be a convert. That always sounds like I'm saying con, but like seriously, I might be converting because I'm going to insert a picture, but these skin stitches are just about perfect. Like they are just happy little bubbles of, of skin stitches and I'm like blown away. It's so easy. <laughs> it's so easy. Um, you know, linen, you deal with the slubs and the, uh, the weft and the weave not necessarily being the same width for each strand of that linen. Um, but even weave, shocking statement number two, um, is even. <laughs> and it's just... It's so beautiful. I just, I can't get over it. So I hope that that came across in that picture. I am impressed and I'm, yeah, I'm just a big fan. Even weave stitching is not typically my favorite thing because the weave is so much denser than linen and I think that it does funny things to my stitches. Um, but I can't argue with the results on the skin. Can't argue with them. So. I worked on this for five days, and I did my counts yesterday, and in five days I did 2,000 stitches. Now some of that was um, skin, and so that adds up really quickly, um, and this was also a holiday week for me, so I had more stitching time on Monday and Tuesday than um, I normally would. Um, so that was like, a, it really was a great way to kickstart Joan Ellie at July for me, um, because I got some good progress on that. Um, I don't know when that's coming back out this year. I hope that it does because I had a lot of fun working on it. Uh, but nonetheless. So there is that. All right. I'm going to come back to the Joan LA July and I'm going to talk about some of my other plans for the rest of July. The first, the next one I should say that I'm going to start working on next Monday is the Fantasy Sal by Lakeside Needlecraft and Doreen Jones. 
this Hogwarts crust is by, uh, I got that from Julie at Nifty Needle Nannies. Um, and we got our last block. And it's a fairy. Talk to you guys about how bothered I was by all of the small human-like characters. And then we got a repeat. This is a fairy. And this is a fairy. I wasn't happy. It's fine. It'll be fine. But I was like, uh, she's beautiful. She's so cute. It will fit the design. It's adorable. It'll be fine. But I was bummed. I was a little bummed. I'm not going to lie. So um, I am going to be working on that block and trying to finish it up as well as try to get some work on the border. I'm not setting any specific goals for the border on this one because Birthstone Dragons is my first goal as far as um, sales for this month. Um, but I do want to get that block done. So here's where I'm starting from. Fabric here is a 32 count Belfast in Heroic by Picture This Plus. So I'm going to try to do the block and some of page two of the border and we'll see what we'll see what I get done. No promises on anything. Okay, so there is that. Now I have three new starts planned for July and I had intended on one, absolutely one, uh, was as I talked about my Ladybird Fairy and I'll show that here in a second. Um, and then I decided I, there's another one that I really want to start for Joan Elliott July. And then yesterday, just before I started filming, I was just about to log off Facebook and, um, sorry, that's, that's bugging me a little bit. Um, I was just about to log off Facebook and I saw this design being stitched by somebody and all plans went immediately out the window. Um, in other words, I stopped, logged onto Etsy and, and ordered this pattern. Um, I have been searching for a decent Game of Thrones themed pattern for a very long time. Now I have my Game of Thrones house banners and that is a beautiful design. Um, but more specifically, I was just looking for something a little bit, a little bit different. Uh, that house banners one will look really great in my office or in, um, in a library. I wanted something that could be out maybe in the rest of the house. Now this is not something that I would necessarily display in the rest of the house, but I just, I'm in love with it. So this is by um, a designer on Etsy named Lolita Maid which will be linked in the description box. Um, and it, she has designed the house banners for most of the houses, most of the major houses in Game of Thrones. And my favorite is the Stark banner. Just, I love that direwolf and winter is coming and it's just so appropriate. So, preview here of what this will look like finished. What I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be stitching the white part. She has two different versions. You can stitch the black on white or you can stitch the white on black or whatever color fabric you choose. Um, and so I'm going to be stitching the white part, but I'm going to be using um, probably 3865 if not 822. Um, so like a neutrally stone light tan color. Um, and I'm going to be stitching that on this. This, ladies and gentlemen, is 32 Count Belfast in Valerian Steel by Hand Dyed Fabrics by Stephanie. And this was the fabric of the month at some point within the last year. And I've been waiting for something to put on this. And finally, my Stark banner is coming home to live on this. <laughs> so excited. I haven't done the measurements yet, so I'm not sure if I need the full fat quarter or if I can trim it down and maybe do the Targaryen sigil on this as well, because that would be great. Um, but, yeah. 
<laughs> oh, I'm so excited. So excited. You know, I, I just talked about how Quaker designs were ticking my box. Um, and this is not Quaker, but because it's monochromatic, it's kind of in that same flavor. Yeah, <laughs> I'm so excited. So I'm starting this on July 16th, which is the start of the penultimate season of Game of Thrones on HBO. Um, and so just to sort of celebrate kickoff, here we go. Okay. Next, let's talk about Ladybird Fairy. Um, and the reason that I did this in this order is that um, I have the fabric for this was a part of my retail therapy. So it will be this lovely transition into retail therapy. So here is Ladybird Fairy. And you can see the background as charted is like that soft blue. I didn't really have anything in my stash that was a soft blue. Um, so I ordered this from Picture This Plus. Now this was my anniversary gift from Danny. Um, my paper anniversary gift, he got me a gift certificate to 123 Stitch. It came in my email, but that's modern paper. <laughs> anyway, so this is 32 Count Belfast in Glacier by Picture This Plus. And this is way more rich than I thought it was gonna be. And I still love it. It feels so starchy. I don't know what that's about. I don't know what that's about, but it feels really funny. Anyway, this is gorgeous. And so that's what my Ladybird Fairy is gonna go on. And I'm excited to start her. So we are into the retail therapy. And my retail therapy, it's like, it's like all fabric. Um, obviously I got that chart. Um, I have some other things on the way, um, including the other Joan Elliott that I'm going to be starting. Um, and that is Lady of the Rose. I, I'll be honest, I wanted to start that for Joan Elliott July, but I totally put it aside because I made this grand statement about your whips and minimal new starts, et cetera, et cetera. And then I was watching Ozzy Stitchers, one of her latest, and she brought up Lady of the Rose, and I was like, oh, right, yeah, gonna need that. So that's on the way, um, along with some other things, because no chart should travel alone. Um, so, yeah, so there, there's that. So I'm gonna be starting that, and I have to decide fabric. I think that this next one that I'm gonna show you might be my fabric for that, which is pretty great. So we're gonna get into fabrics of the month and this is in order that I received them. I have two from each of the two dyers that I have fabric from. And the first one that arrived was from Hand Dyed Fabrics by Stephanie. This is for both of these, 32 Count Belfast. Um, and this is Purple Pansies. And so I'm gonna open this up. I think that my Lady of the Rose might look pretty on this. I hadn't opened this up before. I really like the sort of dual nature of it. It's very purpley down here and really more greeny yellow up here. This is gorgeous. So that's my purple pansies, maybe for Lady of the Rose. Okay. Next, I have uh, the fabric that I was talking to you about that I don't know, but maybe for Enchanted Aurora by Joan Elliott. And this I'm not starting during Joan Elliott July this year. Um, this is from Under the Sea Fabrics, and this is Chloris. <laughs> How crazy would that be to, like, stitch a largely rainbow style on a largely rainbow style fabric? Oh, this is so much fun. Yeah, I have not the first clue what to do with this. I don't know. Do you guys think Enchanted Aurora would look crazy on this? Yeah, and maybe it's too crazy. Maybe it's too much. But, you know, can't, uh, can't knock um, Leslie's dye style. That's just... Oh, so cool. 
Um, and I never thought that I would be able to use Khaleesi, and I did. So Chloris will find its home somewhere. Okay, next also from Leslie is uh, Zephyrus. Yeah, Zephyrus. And this beauty. Oh, this I'm obsessed with. And that's showing up pretty accurately. Um, so we start out with these light blues and mottled purples. And then the purples just start taking over. And then we get to the bottom and it's like 75% purple. I love this one. This is just stunning. And if I didn't start Snow Queen on Darkness Falls, I'd be ordering an opalescent one of these for, for Snow Queen. That's just stunning. So, love that. Not sure what's going on there. Probably some sort of a winter something. But we'll see. Love it. Okay. And this next one came earlier this week. And it is Hand Dyed Fabrics by Stephanie's June Fabric of the Month. And this is Seaside. Maybe this for Lady of the Rose. What do you guys think? Maybe. I've got lots of fabric options these days. This, oh, it's so good. Again, another one. If I hadn't already started um, Seaside Kingdom on Beach Walk, it might have gone on this. Absolutely gorgeous. I love the blues and browns when they play together. That just, that's just happy. So, um, to be determined for another day. So there's that. Okay. Last piece of fabric is, um, it was a swap. So, uh, Matt, who is Trucking Stitcher on Instagram and will hopefully be Trucking Stitcher on Floss Tube, hint, hint, nudge, nudge, um, here before too long, um, he and I decided to do a bit of a fabric swap, um, because as you guys know, he so generously gifted me the Bridge Where She Waits by Stephanie Pumonlaw uh, a couple weeks ago, and I had mentioned that it was really hard to not start it immediately, but I wanted to wait until I had good fabric. So he was like, well, I've got some 25 count, easy count, you want to trade? And I was like, well, I don't, I don't, oh, um, maybe? Let me look in my sash. And I was like, you know, are there any colors that you prefer? And he was like, honestly, just no pink. <laughs> like, well, great, because most of my stash is pink. Um, but we ended up doing a swap, and I sent him a couple of dark blues, um, because, like, I have Daphne and iris and um, from both from under the sea fabrics which are pink <laughs> so anyway so um so we swapped and he sent me this 25 count easy count and <laughs> i'm losing my words here because what he sent i am floored by this I just want you guys to read that label. It says fabric brand easy count, thread count, 25 count, size 36 by 55. Y'all, this is a full yard. <laughs> Words. And you can't really appreciate a full yard until you have a full yard in your hands and you feel the heft of a full yard. I legitimately just paused the video and stood up and tried to showcase how big this thing is, and I can't. Like, the wall is too close. I have to back up a heck of a lot more, like, well into my kitchen in order to be able to show you this. Do you... Unbelievable. Matt, thank you so much. 
I just, I, I can't even, I can't even. I also will need to probably pause to refold this because that will take some effort. Um, so I have um, well enough fabric to start Bridge Where She Waits, which is goal number one after her Faces is done. I'm going to definitely be starting that immediately. Um, but seeing this piece of fabric made me do some thinking. And it's not good when Jessie starts thinking. <laughs> she gets herself into trouble. Um, so here's what Jessie was thinking. Super size free cities by Heaven and Earth Designs. Requires, I believe it's a 40 by 40 inch piece of 25 count fabric. Bridge Where She Waits is only 12 by 14, so she needs, what, 18 by 20. I could do supersize free cities. And that knowledge like almost wakes me up at night, I'm not gonna lie, because I bought Free Cities because I knew that it was gonna disappear right off the Heaven and Earth Designs website. I knew that the second that they made it available, HBO was gonna be like, you know, we're not really into this. And that the licensing was gonna be pulled and it was gonna be retired. I knew it. Um, I never actually thought that I would stitch it. And now that I have this impossible piece of fabric where I could actually see myself doing it, I just, part of me just kind of wants to go for it. Um, it is a super size. So we're talking 999 stitches wide by 999 stitches tall. It is as big as you can get on a Heaven and Earth design. But it's Game of Thrones and y'all know I am all about some Game of Thrones. Love me some Game of Thrones. Not only that, it also has me looking at the other rather large designs that I have in my stash. Um, Laia is very tall. She is very tall. I think she's a total of like 36 inches tall after you add margin. Um, Cliffhanger by Amy Stewart is very tall. Um, I have several projects in my stash, several patterns in my stash that will not fit on a fat half of fabric that I would need a full yard. And now that I have it, <laughs> the, the urge to kit one of them up is strong. I'm not going to. I'm holding off because, and here's, here's what stood out to me as to why I'm not. In This Moment by Jeremiah Kettner, which I started in 2015, I have one page done, and that is my largest heaven and earth design. In the last two months, I started two other very large hates. Um, Alice in a Dolly Dream and Avarice are both almost as large as In This Moment. These are big projects. I don't need to add another that's even bigger than those currently. But because of Matt, I have the freedom to be able to do that. And I just, I can't thank you enough, Matt. That was just the coolest thing. Um, just so very kind and so very generous. And you didn't have to do that. You really didn't. Um, yeah, just mind blown, totally blown. Okay, I'm going to pause here so that I can fold this back up. One thing that I just noticed about this. You know how we all say, you know it's a Zweigart fabric when you can see the orange stripe. You know it's a full yard of a Zweigart fabric when you have two. <laughs> because it's a full yard. It reaches both sides. That's <laughs> amazing. Absolutely astounded. Thank you so much. Okay, let's switch 
to the new segment and I'm going to talk about some things that I'm currently obsessing over. Um, just very briefly, uh, nothing too nothing too crazy. Um, and the first, I'm going to start with a song that I'm listening to kind of on repeat. And it is, um, this is not unusual. Uh, this is happening to a lot of people in the United States as of late. Um, it is Despacito by uh, Luis Fonsi, Daddy Yankee, and Justin Bieber. I, for the life of me, never thought that I would say that I was obsessed with a song that featured Justin Bieber. But y'all, I am obsessed with this song. Can't stop listening to it. And it is a hot song. If you speak any Spanish or you don't, and you have the ability to look up the English translation, do yourself a favor, but like not around children. Um, <laughs> it is an evocative song. It's a provocative song. It's, and it's fun. It's light and it makes you want to dance and, oh, so good. Just obsessed. Um, so that's what I'm currently listening, what I'm currently watching these days that I'm obsessed with, Big Brother. Uh, Big Brother is in its 19th season. They first started in year 2000. Um, and I didn't watch Big Brother from the start. In fact, I didn't start watching Big Brother until Danny and I got together. So about six years ago. Um, Big Brother was never, it was never on my radar. Um, but I'm really into Big Brother this season. And here's why. We are in a, um, <laughs> this is going to sound crazy and okay, fine, but we are in a sort of a pool for Big Brother. Um, so we are in, um, both Danny and I and several of our friends and then several of our friends, friends and such, we are doing, uh, we're essentially gambling on a television show, um, <laughs> So we all put in some money and then we got a team of people. And um, so we have a group of people that we are cheering for and hoping that they win. Um, and so whoever gets first place in our pool gets like $300. Um, whoever gets second place gets less than that. And whoever gets dead last gets $25 because there should be some benefit to being the, the loser. <laughs> And it's changed Big Brother for me because I have to care about these people. And normally, I don't know that I'd be watching this season because I don't like half of the people that are, that are on the show this season. But I have to cheer for these people because they're on my team. So if you're Big Brother, then these names will mean something to you. Um, so my team consists of Megan, who is gone. Um... I have Jason, who is a rodeo clown. I have Ramses, and I have Alex. So I got like all of the people on the outs. <laughs> now, the way that we did this is that we were randomly given three team members, and then we got to choose our fourth. Guess who I chose as my fourth? Ramses, who just got cursed in this last week. Oh, I tell you, I am playing for last, but it's just, it's a lot of fun. It's changed the game because there are people that I have to care about. Um, and it's a lot of fun watching with Danny because then we have these moments where like somebody on his team is playing against somebody on my team. For instance, he has Cody on his team. And if you know what's going on in Big Brother, then you understand that Cody is against everything that my team is about. It's just, it's so cool. It's just fun. Um, so gambling on a television show, something that you probably do in Las Vegas, but um, whatever, you know, it's fun. And then um, something that I'm currently obsessing about reading. This is not a book. It is a magazine. And it is a magazine that I was turned on to by Melanie Dellen, who is the artist um, that charted most recently Toil uh, for Heaven and Earth Designs. 
Um, she, I shouldn't say that she charted, but she did the design and then it was charted. Um, Melanie Dallin has a dark and twisty kind of style and she was featured in this last issue. And so I was curious about what this, what this magazine was. And the second that I uploaded it onto my iPad, I subscribed like bar none. I am finding myself more and more attracted to weird art and like a weird perspective on art. And that's what this magazine is. That's, that's what it is. It features artists with a weird perspective um, or a dark perspective or um, abstract. Um, and it is any sort of visual media. So it is... Um, it is painting, it is um, either digital or oil or what have you, it is photography, it is um, sketches, it's everything. And so they choose a collection of artists and feature them and they share off some of their pieces of art and it's stunning. Some of the things that people are doing with their hands that they're creating that are coming out of their minds I just get lost in this magazine every time I look at it. It is a quarterly magazine, so there's four issues every year. Um, and it was $17 for the subscription. And I can't even with this magazine. It has an article about, I want to say, six or seven artists. And then it has some shorter features on some up-and-coming artists. So some people that we might be seeing more of in the future. And I just, I can't, I can't. Um, I look at it every day and I am so excited about like the next issues. Some of the notable artists that have been featured, um, Melanie Dellen, Anna Dittman, um, these are Heaven and Earth Designs charted artists. So these are names that are potentially recognizable by our community. Uh, Jasmine Beckett Griffith, um, Stephanie Pamela, um, who else? Oh, there was somebody else. Uh, I can't think of it, but anyway, I'm going to insert one that I took a snapshot of, um, just to give you a taste of some of the things that you might see in this magazine. Now, this is from one of the up-and-coming artists. But I thought that it was appropriate for our community because it is embroidery. Um, so, preview of that here. And I can't remember the name of the artist or the name of the artwork, but I'll, I'll list that information down below. Um, I, yeah, I'm just obsessed. Um, and it's oh, so much fun. Just so much fun. You can get a physical subscription. I believe it's based out of Australia. Um, and so a lot of the artists they feature, I believe, are Australian artists. Um, but um, I just went with the digital in part because visuals on an iPad, they are, they are beautiful. And it's right there. It's right there. So, so much fun to look at that. Uh, so, yeah. So that is what I'm currently obsessing over. Okay, y'all. We're getting near the end here. We have just one last topic for conversation and that is knitting, of course. And the first thing that I want to do is answer a couple of questions. So I've had two questions with relation to knitting in the last uh, few videos, one of which I meant to go over last time, but I failed to do so. So I'm going to do that first. Um, and I had a question from Andrea from, excuse me, Andrea, I'm sorry, uh, from Andrea of I Heart Cross Stitch. And she asked, how is it that you turn a skein of yarn into yarn cake? And I tried to do a demo video, but I'm having some issues with my phone and storage space. So I wasn't able to do a demo at this time, but I'll try to do so for um, a future video. Uh, but for this video's sake, I'm just gonna show you the two pieces that I use to turn skein into cake. Okay, so the first piece that I use um, is a yarn swift. And some people will call this an umbrella swift because the mechanism for opening it is a lot like an umbrella and it opens like an umbrella. 
And so basically, when you get a skein of yarn, it is a big loop that is then twisted up into that pretty little hank or skein. Drop in other pieces here. And so you wrap that loop around here, and then this spins so that you can pull the yarn off in one strand off of the swift. And it is, it's got this mechanism because not all skeins are created equal, um, and some of them are a little bit wider circles than others. And so this just uh, attaches to your countertop or wherever you can put it. Uh, this is not, neither of these things are mandatory. I just prefer them because I don't like to hand wind. Um, if you want to do this without these, you absolutely can. You just have to have something to put your big loop of yarn around so that you can pull one strand at a time. Uh, some people will recommend the back of a chair um, and some will use um, their knees. So they'll sort of lay down, bend their knees and then lay that loop around their knees. And I've done that before. But I don't love it. It takes a long time. This is done in five, 10 minutes, tops. Although that one skein took me almost an hour. Anyway, the second piece, and this is where the cake is formed. So this is called a ball winder. So very descriptive. And this is kind of a heavy duty one um, because I was winding some rather large skeins. I have a smaller one that I don't use anymore because this one is, I just like it so much better. So again, it has a mechanism here where it attaches to your counter. Generally speaking, you'll put this on one side of your counter and your swift on the other so that that one strand of yarn can come through here, okay? Now this is on like a rubber ring so that it can move back and forth. Um, but I just, generally speaking, will hold mine steady, okay? It also has this here, this arm here. So your one strand of yarn will come through here and then come through here. The top here has two slits in it, so you can actually lay that yarn over through here, lock it in so that you can have a center pole ball. So when you're done winding, you lift that up and you have a center pull ball, which is really great for yarn management. It just makes it so much easier because it's, it's more compact and it doesn't roll around necessarily. And then it's on a hand crank. And so as you're winding, you just run this and this arm here wraps the yarn around the ball. And so that's how you get cake essentially that's what I that's how I make yarn cake um, this is one of the pricier brands uh, both of these are by Stanwood Needlecraft that I got from Amazon this one was a Christmas gift um, I got one I had a ball winder for very cheap from knit picks that served me well for a very long time until I started using it more frequently and on very large skeins of yarn. So for instance, I cannot wind um, a full thousand yard skein of lace on that small one. I have to do it on this because it's just so much bigger. But if all you're doing is winding one skein of standard size sock yarn, so like 400 yards, give or take, that totally fits on the, the, the one that I had from Netflix. Um, there is somebody on YouTube um, and she runs U University and just recently, within the last week, she put up a video sort of explaining the different ball winders and comparing them pros and cons. So I'm going to link that down below if anybody's interested in checking it out. I haven't watched it myself because I'm afraid that she's going to introduce a new ball winder that I'm going to want um, when this one has served me well for a few years now. Um, but yeah, so that's essentially how you make cake. Hopefully I can do a demo here before too long, um, but we'll see. We'll see about that. 
Okay, the next question that I had, and the last question, uh, before I start showing you projects, um, was from Cassie Stitches, and she said, um, what does blocking mean? Essentially, blocking your knitting is helping your project, what I consider reaching its fullest potential. So, I have an example here. I blocked something, and I'm going to insert a picture here of what it looked like before. This was before I wove in any ends. This was before, um, before it soaked and before I pinned it out. This was before I did anything to it. Okay, so you can tell that everything is kind of scrunched up. Is it a usable garment? Yeah, sure. I could, I could wear it just as it was. Um, it, when you finish an edited project, you can just be done. But blocking helps it tremendously. And this design was the 2015 uh, Through the Loops Mystery by Kirsten Kapoor, uh, which is now called the Liz Christie. Um, that was officially what it was named, which is, I believe, after a, um, a garden designer in New York City, working on rooftop gardens. Anyway, so here it is, finished and blocked. And the first thing that you're going to see is the blue section at the bottom. Do you see how much bigger that is? How much more open and how much more pointed the ends are? That's what blocking does. It opens up your lace so that the holes are more visible. So blocking is just pulling everything out to where you want it. And it's not an intuitive thing. Um, at least it's not for me. I've had to fiddle with things a lot. Um, my fairy hill is not blocked exactly how I would have wanted it, but um, it's just to help it open up and to reach its full potential. So now I have a garment that I can wear. I would never wear this one like this because I believe it's a half by or something like that. So I would wear it more like that. Come over here. Here we go. So there's that. And so that's blocking. Crash course from a novice. There we go. Okay. So let's get on with some things that I have been knitting and then um, some purchases. So the first thing is that I have worked on my Sprites Fenjol by Curious Handmade. Um, and that is the lace weight one that I showed you last time. I haven't made a ton of progress on it. I should have had it done before the end of June, but that didn't happen, um, and so I'm still working on it, but it's not high priority anymore. Next, something that I do have to show you. Um, last time we spoke, the next day I was casting on the new 2017 mystery by Kirsten Kapoor, the Through the Loop Summer Shawl mystery, um, and so I did, and I'm behind. Uh, Clue 4 came out yesterday. I am working on Clue 2. Yeah, so slow but steady, winning the race. So this is a two-color shawl, and we started down here. Now this is going to be an asymmetrical triangle, is what the final shape is going to be. We started down here with the lace, and this lace is going to be another one that's going to benefit greatly from blocking, because what you probably can't see there is that the lace, there are clusters of holes, and it is four holes per cluster. Uh, let me see if I can get it to show. You probably can't see that. Um, nope, not getting it to show, not fighting with it. Um, so, anyway, so there's the lace, and then we move into the mosaic, and the mosaic is essentially slip stitch color work um, where I am working with two colors. Sorry, needles. There we go. Handle those needles. So you can kind of see the V's with the bar running underneath them in each of those colors alternating. How pretty is that? And then again, we're back into the same lace, and then there's another mosaic section that will be a little bit different. And then there's another big chunk of the lace and another mosaic section that's a little bit different. This thing is so cool. Having a blast. Um, so let's talk about yarn. 
The yarns I'm using are Madeline Tosh Air Light, which is a merino silk alpaca blend, um, which makes it a little bit fuzzy. And my colors are Jade, this gorgeous green. And this cake, uh, this color A runs out real fast. Um, this is Great Gray Owl, and this is the one that I meant to show you, but I didn't have it last time. So it's just a nice, a nice soft gray, silvery color. Um, but you can tell I'm using the heck out of this one because my cake is starting to disintegrate. Um, so yeah, so there's that. And the minute that I fell behind is the minute this became not so high priority. Um, but I work on it when I can. This yarn is so soft, y'all. Ooh, is that nice. Um, and it's going to be warm. Uh, this is being knit on US size 7, 4.5 millimeter needles. And I have the world's smallest cable <laughs> for this one. Um, this one and the next one I'm about to show you are going to switch cables because just you wait. So, so there's that. The next thing is something that I cast on yesterday um, because I don't have enough large shells on the needles. Whatever. Um, and this is the third shawl for the Shawl Society 2 by Curious Handmade Helen Stewart. And um, it kicked off yesterday, so I'm on time. And this is my new focus piece. This thing is going to be so cool, you guys. Um, this is a shape that Helen has never done before, but it is a wrap. And what that means is that it is a long rectangle, rectangle, rect triangle, honestly. It is a long rectangle, and um, it is wide. It doesn't look very wide right now because it will block out to be a little bit wider. Um, and it is three colors, so we have these two colors that are striping in these chevrons, and then there's going to be some lace. And uh, so let me talk to you about the yarns. I cast on with this one. And this is denim. Um, all three of these are Madeline Tosh uh, Pashmina, which is a merino silk cashmere sport weight blend. Now this shawl calls for a heavy fingering, um, but I just went with a sport weight um, because this uh, sport weight is essentially a heavy fingering. It's just a little bit plumper than fingering. So... Anyway, so I decided to just go with this, even though it's not really a heavy fingering. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Okay, so this is denim, and I have an absolute crap ton of this in my stash because I had ordered it on a D stash originally to do a sweater, but that never happened. I um, mean, it won't happen because I'm not going to do a merino silk cashmere sweater. I shouldn't say that. It's... Um, that I pulled one of the skeins to do a shawl and so I don't have enough and I would have to blend it and denim is a discontinued colorway by Alan Tosh. So anyway, all of that to say I started with denim. I have a ton of it and color A, uh, Helen advises that you have, um, I believe it calls for 320 yards, um, but gauge and mileage may vary so I just wanted to make sure I had enough of color A. This is approximately 306, 340 yards, so it's good to have a little bit of wiggle room. Okay, my second color is Farmhouse White. And so it's really just a, a white neutral, not much tonality to it. There is a little bit, um, but so there's that. So those are the two colors I'm striping. Okay, next we have my colorway that I will be using for the lace. And I gotta tell you, I don't normally think of brown for lace, and I wouldn't have picked this, but somebody on the Ravelry group um, was like, it would be so pretty if you striped the white and the blue and did the brown as the lace. So that's what I'm gonna do, because it's totally not what I would normally pick, which would be nice. And this is weathered frame. And again, not a whole lot of variegation, um, which is fine by me for the lace, um, and just a really gorgeous brown color. So those are my three colors. A lot of people are going a lot brighter because they always do. Everybody goes for the brights. I grow, go more tonal, but I think this is gonna be gorgeous. 
I just think it's gonna be so pretty. Um, and loving it so far. So in order to finish on time for the mini knit along in Helen's group, I need to knit 14 rows a day. The cool thing about this is that because this is a wrap, uh, the rows don't get any longer. Like it's gonna stay at this number of stitches for basically the whole thing. Now she does, there is some, some minor adjustments based on gauge in lace versus chevron stripes, but it's not going to get bigger. So whatever I do every day, it's never going to change. Like the stitch, the number of stitches isn't going to like skyrocket like it did with Sprite's Fence. So anyway, so there's that. This I will be working on every day uh, to get my 14 rows done, and then we'll see after that. Now, I just told you this is not going to get any bigger. Do you see this cable? This cable is huge. I got the biggest one I could because I didn't have one of the biggest ones that I could. <laughs> so I'm going to have to switch this with um, the Through the Loops Mystery 2017 because, yeah, that's totally unnecessary. Okay, so there's that. All right, and then last, um, not the last thing, second to last thing, um, are some yarny acquisitions. And so I bought two skeins of yarn. Um, I should mention, no, I won't mention that. Okay, uh, so I have two skeins of yarn here with planned project. Anybody surprised? Anybody at all? We're in an orange. And this is the fox, because you guys know how much I talk about the fox in my uh, Hohi mystery wrap. And this is Heartbeat. These are both Madeline Tosh Tosh Vintage, which is 100% Superwash Merino in a worsted weight. And these are going to be part of my Saugerties shrug. I'm finally going to have a Saugerties once I get the rest. <laughs> So I'm going to insert a picture of the Saugerties here. It is a shrug pseudo sweater. Um, if I'm honest, it would be a sweater if it had a closure at the front. Um, it is long bell sleeves and the, uh, the cuffs are color work. And so I'm going to knit one the color work with orange and one with maroon. So it's gonna be my hokey Saugerties. And I'm gonna get, um, I think I'm probably gonna do a soft gray or a soft tan for the majority of the body um, in this same base so that um, I will have that. And I am so excited for this. I have loved this design since 2014, since it was released. It's just so pretty. And um, it will get a lot of wear because it'll be so good for football season. So much fun. So, very excited about that to knit those up. Okay, so that's it for the yarny stuff. Um, one more yarny mention, and that is that we have a new yarny group on Facebook. Um, and it is a sister group to Cross Stitch It's Fun. It's called Yarn Craft It's Fun. And I will link it down below. Um, it is run by the same people that run Cross Stitch It's Fun. So Charity and Mindy and Corey and Netta. And um, they're all well into yarn craft. And so if you crochet or you knit, come join the group. Um, there's a couple of cows that they're running. Uh, I know that on July 19th, they are starting Kryptonite by Melanie Berg. I can't. I can't start another three color shawl right now. Um, but I will be working on my three color shawls. To, to help celebrate because it's for Corey's birthday. And then at some point in September, they're doing a um, fingerless mitts knit along. And so I'll be jumping in on that, uh, but I'll talk about that closer to time. They're doing this October. Um, and it's just, it's just a fun little group of people talking about yarny goodness. Um, I haven't been a part of a yarn group on Facebook before, so I was really excited about this. Um, so yeah, come check it out. Um, you guys, we did it. We reached the end. 
my voice went up three pitches, which is which it always does when I get to the end of my videos because I get thirsty. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we are there. And so I am not going to hold us over for much longer. I just want to say thank you, everybody, for sticking with me. Um, thank you to those of you who reached out and were like, hey, where are you? Um, and I will see you guys in the next one. Oh. Thanks, guys. You are the greatest. This community is my favorite. As always, be kind. See you later. Bye. You know, in volleyball, I'm going to make a weird sports metaphor here. In volleyball, uh, one player sets and then the next player spikes. Well, when I pulled this out, I felt like I was setting it and then the universe spiked it <laughs> and was like, get back down. No, don't. I took the hint from the universe. Too warm. Too crazy. Fix your crazy hair, girl. Can't be helped. Okay. Let's try this again. Um, my gut check reaction, reaction, 